Muy buenas, muy buenas noches, bienvenidos a Universidad Galileo, a, a los que nos están visitando y, y obviamente bienvenidos también a los, a los alumnos de Universidad Galileo, de las eh, carreras de ingeniería. El día de hoy tengo el honor de, 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 de estar aquí como, eh, como presidente de, del capítulo de Communication Society de la IEEE Guatemala en lo que se le llama el Distinguished Lecture Tour, o sea, es un tour que hacen eh, conferencistas distinguidos y usualmente tocan tres países, o tienen que tocar por lo menos tres países. En, este, en esta ocasión, eh, el doctor Dixit eh, estuvo en Panamá, eh, tenemos la, el, el honor de tenerlo aquí en Guatemala y luego va para Honduras. Entonces, usualmente tenemos esta clase de eventos eh, una vez al año, si, si nos va bien, pues tenemos tal vez dos al año, pero la idea de, de las sociedades de IEEE es, es esa especialización en ciertos temas de, o en grandes áreas del conocimiento. Entonces, en esta ocasión, pues es eh, la parte de Communication Society. Communications se refiere… No, a, no como se refiere muchas veces aquí como una carrera de comunicación, sino que es telecomunicaciones o es la parte de internet, de protocolos, eh, tecnologías de transmisión, ¿verdad? todo eso embarca todo lo que es el, la sociedad de, de comunicaciones como tal. Entonces, el día de hoy tenemos el, el, el honor de tener a, al doctor Suder Dixit, ¿verdad?, eh, con su charla Towards the Internet of Senses, Interrating Humankind Senses and 6G. Él es cofundador y CEO del Basic Internet Foundation en Oslo, Noruega. Es docente eh, de 6G Flagship University of Oulu, Finland, en Finlandia. Y bueno, eh, su, su CV es bastante extenso, ¿verdad? Y, y una de las grandes razones, obviamente, él trabaja muy de cerca. Eh, a nivel de global en todo lo que es IEEE y todo lo que es la sociedad de, de comunicaciones dentro de IEEE, en conferencias, ha sido editor, eh, grandes, eh, muy buenas publicaciones, tiene patentes, ¿verdad? Entonces, es eh, realmente una eminencia y es un gran honor tenerlo aquí y que ustedes poder compartir ese conocimiento con todos ustedes, sobre todo jóvenes, ¿verdad? Para que miren hacia dónde van las tendencias de las comunicaciones. Eh, y qué es lo que ustedes, hacia dónde ustedes se pueden proyectar al futuro. Entonces, uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Dixit, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marcos. Uh, thanks to all the faculty here at uh, Galileo University. Uh, good evening. Um, buenos noches, buenos tardes. That's the extent of my Spanish but uh, I will uh, give my talk in English. I uh, hope uh, most of you will be able to understand it. I'll be slow. Um, so as mentioned uh, by Marcos, uh, Professor Marcos, that um, my talk is mostly going to be about uh, 6G. Uh, we all know that um, 4G and 6G is being rolled out. And we all talk about technologies. Um, however, let's step back and think about what is the role of human in all of this. We talk a lot about machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication, Internet of Things, and cloud computing, edge computing, and all the nice things in technology terms. But uh, what are we doing? Uh, about the humans. Uh, humans have a big role to play with the new kind of applications that are coming. And I will uh, touch upon that. So why should the human in the loop be of interest? Just think about it. Uh, we are the consumers of applications. We are the consumers of the data. We are also using gaming applications, uh, we are doing um, uh, holography, uh, 3D, and uh, all kinds of uh, very fascinating applications 
uh, that we all are doing on our smartphones or we will be doing in the next uh, five to 10 years to 15 years. So human plays a big role. And it's all about giving us all a very good experience, right? Uh, we all want to have good experience. We want to have um, uh, the information displayed very quickly without any latency, without any delay. So it's all about experience. And now we are talking more and more about unstructured data, not structured data. Structured data is what you capture using machines uh, from IoT devices, and you store them, and the computers will process it. And unstructured data is mostly speech, uh, images, uh, videos. They, they are going to be playing a bigger role in a new kind of applications or what you will see in the future on these smart devices connecting over 5G or 6G. And machines are not very good in processing speech. They are not very good in processing images. They are not very good in processing uh, videos. It's the human who does a, the best job. Uh, we all talk about AI, machine learning, but AI machine learning is very good in predicting the future based on the past data, the data that has been accumulated, uh, like uh, big data. But it cannot, it can only predict the future based on what happened in the past. But humans have uh, this uh, uncanny ability to predict things that uh, may, that the data may not be able to predict what our gut feel is, what we think is going to happen. Uh, that computers are not very good at doing. So how do we make sense of the qualitative information then of the quantitative information? That is where humans are very good at. You know, how do we predict the, predict the future when we don't have the information about the presence present time or we don't have good information about the past. That is where humans are very good and I don't think computers will be able to beat that in the near future. Unless we can replicate human mind with, with machines in some time in the future and I will uh, talk about that a little later. So why human in the loop should be of interest? There have been great ad advances in technology, we all know that. In communication technology, we have 4G, we have 5G, uh, we can get uh, tens of megabit uh, per second of speed to our smartphone. There are huge advances in electronics, whereby you have touch, you have uh, 4K display on our devices, or even higher resolution, uh, 4K high definition TV. Uh, we have uh, foldable displays. Hopefully we will have the displays that you can just bend like a piece of paper and that will come in the near future. So there are big, big advances in electronics and there are big advances in sensing. Sensing meaning with IoT devices, how do we sense what's happening around us in our environment? How do we sense the smell? electronic nose, how do we sense the, the taste, what we are eating. So there are devices coming in the near future. And there are huge advances in material science uh, and in data science. We all know about data science uh, because of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, blockchain, and computer science is playing a huge role much, in, much more role than what 6G and connectivity is doing for us uh, today. Connectivity only provides you information from play, place A to B, or from many places to many places, or from machine to machine or IoT, but it's all the computer science that makes sense out of it, and it presents the data to us which is meaningful to human beings and also to the human being, uh, to the machines. So that's why human in the loop should be of great interest to us all. 
and there is a, also a growing interest in social and well-being. Some of you may wear a smart watch, or you may have a smart app on your on your phone that will measure the number of steps you have you have walked, or it can tell you how uh, good sleep you had uh, the night before, or it would it would probably be able to measure your heartbeat. And perhaps in the future, it will be able to see what your health is and try to predict what may be something bad that may happen to your health. So personal well-being is going to be very important. And healthcare is going to be the big, one of the big areas when we think about 6G and about uh, smart devices and sensing that will affect us all, especially the older people and the aging population. Okay, so if we look uh, back, if uh, those of you who have uh, been taught in the classroom about the history of computers, the computers in the 1940s and 1950s, they used to fill whole rooms. These mainframe computers used to be based on uh, vacuum tubes. They needed cooling and they, they consumed a lot of power. They, are not, they were not very reliable. So basically, the mainframe computers, they filled the whole rooms. That's how it used to be in the past. There used to be magnetic tapes. There used to be uh, uh, punch cards. And those used to be the input-output devices, input devices in the computers back in the 1950s. Not solid-state memory and solid-state transistors as we know it today. And Vacuum tube-based televisions have been with us even up until 10, 15, 20 years ago. So yesterday's computers, they filled the whole rooms. But now what is happening, we still have a lot of computing and storage they are filling our rooms, but they have a different kind of form factor. They look different. And this is how we have it today. So our television is connected to internet. Nowadays, so compute, televisions have become computers because it is doing a lot of software processing is connected to the internet. Uh, that's how you are watching the television programs, the channel. So television today has become a computing device, a storage device. It's a display device. So that's how it is. Uh, we have a smartphone that we are s uh, sitting with when we are watching the television. We can stream our content from our smartphone to the TV, or we can have uh, 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 photographs in our bedroom or in our uh, sitting room, uh, digitally displaying the uh, personal photographs connected to the internet, bringing it from the internet, uh, bringing it from the internet. We could have internet connected microwaves and a refrigerator be connected to the internet as well, and not to mention about the washing machines and dryers and so on and so forth. So this is what is happening, that our houses and our living rooms are filled with computing devices, but these are all distributed computing and distributed storage, and they are all connected with some kind of a gateway with some kind of a, a broadband connection through a set-top box or through Wi-Fi, which connects with the internet to your cloud storage to be able to do all kinds of nice things. So today is the same thing, uh, what we did yesterday, except that it is distributed in our environment. So what is happening? as we go from 5G to 6G, just to give you a little bit of background to those of you who are not uh, very familiar with the 4G technology, 5G technology. So if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at this picture, I think some of you, I don't know if you are able to see uh, this uh, slide from the back of the room. This inner diagram shows the capabilities of the 5G. So the 5G mobile standard was designed so that it will deliver to our mobile phone 100 megabit per second of information, no matter where you are. 
you have a 5G coverage, you should be able to get 100 megabit per second. But if you are close to the tower, 5G tower, you should be able to get one gigabit per second. As you move away from a 5G tower or the cell site, your bandwidth that you get will decline. So that is how 5G is supposed to deliver. Uh, it is supposed to give, connect uh, millions of devices, tens of thousands of devices. A latency is promised to be one millisecond to deliver the content, and so on and so forth. But the blue diagram here shows the capabilities of the 6G standard, the mobile 6G standard that is being worked on right now. And hopefully it will be completed by 3GPP and HC standard in Europe and ITU by 2030 time frame. And the goal of 6G is that uh, uh, people will, you'll be able to get one gigabit per second of bandwidth on your mobile phone and up to one terabit per second if you are near the 6G uh, uh, mobile tower or the access point. So this is the speed and the performance that you will be able to get. I don't want to go into all the other numbers, but you can look at these numbers if you Google what are the requirements or what are the aspirations or the vision for 6G standard that the researchers and the, uh, the industry uh, they are working on. So up until now, all of these requirements were driven by key performance indicators. That were the goals. But now as we go to 6G, people are already talking about that we should be focusing on our quality of service, quality of, uh, um, uh, quality of life, uh, KPIs, not quality of uh, these quantitative measures. Means 6G should be able, we should be able to measure how 6G has improved the healthcare of the population in, in, uh, in Guatemala. If fewer people are getting, uh, if fewer people are getting sick, that means 6G has made an impact. If fewer people are traveling on the road, that means 6G has provided good remote connectivity so people don't have to travel so that there is less congestion on the road, there is less pollution. So this is how we should be able to measure the success of the technologies, the future technology. So the experts are talking about that we need qualitative key performance indicators, not only focus on quantitative measures or requirement of a particular standard. So this is the difference that is there now where we go from 5G to 6G. Uh, this picture shows that uh, uh, as we go from 5G to 6G, there are some other goals that have been defined by International Telecommunication Union. What ITU is saying that what has happened historically that as we have gone from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G, the digital divide in the world is widening. Fewer, of few, fewer and fewer people are connected, which is very bad. You know, If you look at uh, the uh, Africa, if you look at uh, Latin America, if you look at Southeast Asia, there are many people who are not able to get 4G or 3G. They are not getting broadband. So even though the Europe and the advanced countries, they are talking about 4G and 5G, but the benefits of these standards are not reaching almost about half of the world. So ITU has said that as we develop 6G, one of the goals should be that we are able to provide ubiquitous connectivity to everybody in the world so that everybody is able to take the benefit of it. So if somebody from Guatemala flies into Chicago, and if the person is not uh, digitally literate, this person cannot even ent uh, enter through the airport because the person doesn't uh, know how to scan his or her passport. When I was coming to Guatemala, 
It asked me to fill out an immigration form that was sent by Marcos. And I had to develop this QR code. Look, if I didn't have a smartphone and if I was not literate, I really could not do that. I mean, there is no way I could fill it out or if I were lit illiterate, coming from Democratic Republic of Congo uh, or Burundi from Africa to Guatemala, I would have a very hard time. I just can't enter, you know. So this is the problem that we have as we develop a new, uh, new technology. We are rolling it out, but we are forgetting a lot of the people around the world. And they are as many as about uh, 3 billion people who, are, who don't know how to use a smartphone or they do not have the internet connectivity. So this is the world we are living in. So I just wanted to show this picture that ITUs has also defined these qualitative measures of the standard of 6G, where they say that, we were, we, that the world should be able to connect the unconnected. And in the latter part of my talk, I will talk about what is the initiatives that IEEE is doing to connect the rest of the world. Sustainability is one of the goals. And security, privacy, and resilience is also very important, especially for people who are not digitally literate. Uh, it is very important for them. And also, ubiquitous intelligence, how can that be available everywhere and everybody can take advantage of. OK. So and we know, as we use the smartphone, all these kind of applications, that we need to focus on cyber and physical worlds they're combining. What this means is that is, there is a digital world. Digital world meaning that uh, if I am here in Guatemala, and if I come to uh, uh, Galileo University, I come to the front entrance, and if I take a picture of it, it brings all the information about uh, the university to me on, the, uh, on my smartphone without me having to type anything, just with the picture. It should be able to give me all the history. It should be able to give me the physical uh, layout of the buildings where they are. And it should be able to help me to go to the different departments and schools I want to go to, depending upon where I'm interested in. So the digital world and physical world getting connected. And that is going to happen sooner or later. It's simply a matter of time. So 6G research that people are doing around the world, it needs to focus on cyber and physical worlds continuum. And, but when we talk about um, uh, uh, the, the cyber world, we also have to be very about, uh, worry about the cyber security, that there is not bad data, uh, that is not compromised data that is being sent to uh, the physical world, the two are getting uh, connected and uh, somebody else is taking advantage of of sending me to the wrong place uh, because of that. Okay, so so we are entering a hyper connected world. Some of you are learning about Internet of Things. So whether we like it or not, there are going to be all kinds of IoT devices, all kinds of sensors, and just think about for a moment that if we all have some kind of environmental sensors in our smartphones that can measure the carbon dioxide, uh, how much ozone is there. Uh, it can um, uh, measure my environment wherever I am. And if everybody can measure it from their smartphone wherever they are, like what happens in the uh, Google Map. You know what Google Map does is it's collecting information from all of us. But what about human mind and all kind of senses that we have and body in the architecture? We keep on developing these distributed architecture. And I know I was talking to uh, Christian yesterday. He's very much involved in edge computing and so on and so forth. But what is the role of humans in all of this? You know, where as we develop the architecture, where is the human in this distributed computing architecture? It has to be there somewhere. Uh, so I'll touch upon that a little bit. And human mind, which plays a big role, uh, that I'll come to uh, later on. And our body in the architecture. So just uh, to tell you a little bit about when we talk about 6G, 
and about computer science and so on and so forth uh, when we talk about uh, mobile communication. And this really applies to many of you who are getting engineering degrees in electronics, telecommunications, and uh, uh, data science, and so on and so forth. Really, the opportunities are not necessarily in the radio communication. The opportunities are in electronics and material science. Opportunities are in wireless communication, and opportunities, real opportunities are in computer science and engineering. Electronics and materials in nanoelectronics, because this is, you know, um, we take all these photographs and we find out quickly how, how quickly our, the memories fill up. So how to compress more and more data in our smartphones, in our smartphones. So uh, microelectronics is playing a big role. Nanoelectronics is very important. And these smartphones have many, many of these uh, uh, antennas, GPS. Uh, we have got Bluetooth. We have got Wi-Fi. We have got uh, uh, 4G antenna, 5G antenna. And these are all uh, receivers and transmitters. And we, cannot, we just cannot have so many of these transmitters and receivers. So the challenges are how can we have one transmitter and one receiver, and from the same transmitter and receiver, you can tune it in different parts of the spectrum for Bluetooth for, and for uh, 5G and also for Wi-Fi using the same electronics. So how do we have uh, more, uh, more functionality from a given uh, electronics that is there in our device? So that is the challenge. Terahertz, amazing. Uh, 2D, 3D, imagine we all have phones. And sooner or later, these you'll be able to do 3D imaging. And But how do you compress all of this uh, physical thing capabilities in the smart devices? So electronics is a big area uh, where there are huge research opportunities. But this is mostly on the, uh, on the physical layer side. Energy harvesting, how can you harvest energy from our environment, from the light that we have in the room? That is another big area of research. Wireless communication is about uh, radio communication, about uh, OFDM, uh, about the spectrum, and so on and so forth. And then obviously we all know about uh, augmented reality, big data analysis, uh, machine learning, and uh, AI. You know, the computer science is what uh, you take advantage of to deliver smarter applications, that, that to uh, deliver uh, to the end user or to the machine. So computer science is probably where most of the money is being made, and it will continue to be made. That's why AI, ML, and to think about how can one innovate in AI, ML, for networking, what do you do with AI ML? When you do customer profiling, what do you market to the uh, user? Uh, all those huge opportunities are there. Uh, you probably get the idea here. That's not only about the communication, but 6G also creates a lot of opportunities in many other uh, disciplines of uh, engineering, including packaging, uh, heat dissipation, and uh, battery technology. Uh, and so on and so forth. So what is the 6G uh, about? Uh, so I'll, I'll just give you a perspective about what some of the big players are saying. Ericsson is saying that uh, the 6G is going to be, and the internet going to be, about the internet of senses. So that means connecting all these internet uh, IoT devices around the world, and also, uh, also communicating not only uh, voice, video, but also uh, in images, what our eyes see, and uh, what our cameras send, and also what we hear, and what we speak, but also about our smell. How do we trans capture our smell? How do we send it uh, to the other, uh, other uh, party? How do we transmit our taste? And how do we synthesize the taste? How do we present a more immersive experience to the other end, to our family and friends. So it's about going to be our internet of senses. That's what Ericsson is saying. Nokia's vision is on sixth 
sends from networks. So what Nokia is saying that they have deployed all these uh, uh, antennas and uh, they have towers and they are beaming uh, information uh, and uh, from their uh, antennas or the uh, tower from the towers. So basically, they get reflections from buildings. They get reflections on their antennas in the receivers. So can they use this reflection to create the map of the area, physical area? So how can they take advantage of the uh, reflections and create the physical map, create a sixth sense? So Nokia is very much interested in sixth sense from networks. Uh, but basically, software will dominate the communication systems. So it's all about softwareized communication network. So routing will happen in software. Uh, deep packet inspection will happen in software. Uh, uh, all of these networking functions that we have known about, or whatever you have learned in your network protocol uh, uh, courses, all of that will happen in software. Uh, because there is no need for this to be done by hardware anymore because the amount of computing that is available and that all can be done in virtualized machines in a data, data center. Uh, okay, so, okay, I'll skip some of these things. So, actually, if we know about internet, you know, uh, maybe I can ask this question. The internet that we have today is best of all. Meaning, when you send some information from here to uh, uh, San Francisco or to uh, uh, Buenos Aires or someplace, on internet is going is going on the same backbone networks. You're sending data, you're sending speech, uh, voice over uh, uh, IP, uh, images, video. Everything is going on the same network. They're sharing this internet. That's why the quality of service is not good. Because video is consuming all of these resources about internet. So, so up until now, one size fits all network solution. It was one solution that was fitting, serving all the needs, all kinds of applications. But people are looking into network slicing. Can we design different networks, slice it the network, one for data, another one for voice, another one for video, third one for speech, and one for healthcare, and one for government applications. Can we build an internet, logical internet, for different kind of applications and different kind of data? So you'll get the quality of service, and if you get the quality of service, then you can sell different quality of service to different users and charge them differently. So the mobile operators are very much interested in this network slicing model. Like today, we have VLANs, right? Some of you have learned about virtual LANs in, in the campus, right? You have virtual LAN for one department, another one for another one. It's the same Ethernet, but it's divided into virtual LANs. Why can't we divide the internet into virtual internet for different kind of applications so that uh, there will be different quality of service. And then the operator will be able to charge differently to hospitals, it will be able to charge differently to universities, it will be able to charge uh, differently to, uh, to the government, to the transport industry, to the airline, and they can make more money that way. That's why mobile operators are very much interest, interested in network slicing. Okay. And then now, right now, we all are very busy, you know. Uh, we have got uh, lots and lots of information that is being dumped on us. And, uh, but we are very worried about our healthcare also, because we don't have time. You have to study for your exam, uh, you have to talk to your friends, you want to watch movies, you have to be, you are on WhatsApp, you have all, all, all kinds of social media. And it's affecting people's lives also, because people are not getting enough exercise. Especially people are, uh, the, the bad thing, uh, and, and the good thing is that yeah, things have become much more efficient. You don't have to go somewhere. You have a lot of uh, knowledge and information available. But the, but the big challenge that we all have is that you have to sit in front of the computer. 
If you sit in front of the computer, that means you're not getting exercise. If you're not getting enough exercise, your health is going to be affected sooner or later. You're going to get diabetes, you're going to gain weight, your, uh, your gain, your, if you gain weight, your knees will become bad, your legs will become weak, and so on and so forth. So we'll have a different diseases that will happen at an early age than our parents or grandparents used to have. So this is the price that we are paying for convenience. So people are becoming more and more uh, uh, aware, and they are want to pay attention to, have, uh, to for their well-being and have a holistic life experience. So this known, uh, this slide, which is a very simple uh, slide, what is the definition of a holistic life, healthy life, right? There are basically three things that are happening. First one is the internal stimuli, right? Like what our brain is thinking, you know, we are all born with certain kind of a brain structure, some capabilities like Somebody is left-handed, somebody is right-handed, uh, somebody is very good in language, somebody is very good uh, athlete, and so on and so forth. So we are born with certain capabilities and ability to uh, uh, critically uh, deal with certain situations and problems. So that is our internal, our mind is whatever it is, but we can, of course, train it and make it better. Then our body health, you know, we have organs, uh, some people have some different kind of genes that they are born with. Uh, they have uh, acquired them from their parents, uh, from their grandparents, uh, from both sides, and so on and so forth. So your body health is there, right? Uh, how much exercise you get, and so on and so forth. But this external stimuli plays a big role, you know. How much time you are spending on social media, what kind of content you are watching, what kind of TV programs you watch, that affects your brain, right? So if you watch uh, horror movies, uh, you will develop your brain in a different way. If you watch a lot of conspiracy theories, you'll think about uh, conspiracies around uh, you, and so on and so forth. If you watch uh, religious content, you're probably going to be more religious. So there is external stimuli that we are surrounded with. So for a holistic life, if we want to live, we have to be able to balance this, take care of what we consume, we don't want to consume a lot of negative content. Uh, dif uh, depends on what we call negative. It varies from person to person. And what is the positive uh, content that we want to see? And internal stimuli, how, uh, how we think internally, how much exercise we go. We go for a walk. Uh, we go to beach. Uh, we go swimming, and so on and so forth. And body health. So it's a really a personal decision, you know. At the end of the day, nobody is going to tell you you should live this life or that life, what you should eat, what you should not eat. Uh, so it needs a lot of self-control. And uh, we all get very excited uh, with so many things. That's a big problem with all of us, including me. There's so many fascinating things happening around us, whether it is politics, whether it is uh, health, is, whether it is about uh, AI, which is electronics engineering, computer science, mechanical engineering, we are, we get interested in so many things, and suddenly we find we are overwhelmed. We are not able to deal with this, and we get, uh, uh, we get tired, you know. We are confused. What is the best thing to do? So uh, the best thing to be able to do is to be able to decide what I will not do, that is a very hard thing to do. Like I wrote to Marcos, well, I wanted to come here and this and that. Well, he said, he could have said, well, you know, this is another task on me. Do I want to deal with this or not, you know? These are additional tasks that get created. So, so these are personal decisions. And you, all of you know about Steve Jobs, who was the founder of Apple and so on and so forth. What he was very good at was he had the self-discipline on what he will not do. He will listen to 10 different things, 20 different things, and he will say, he will, uh, he will decide, he'll pick out what makes sense uh, and what he will not do. He'll say, this is all garbage. I'm not interested in it. It's not my priority for the last next three years, two years, three years, five years, like 
like a lot of you are doing like undergraduate degree, right? Bachelor's degree or master's. So you, are, you have certain priorities and you want to get a good GPA grade. So you want to prioritize, I want to study. This is, I've got only two years left, three years left. If I do spend a lot of time on other things, my GPA will get affected. So it's all about prioritizing your life. So what I will not do, and some people are able to do many things, and, some, uh, and many people are not able to do too many things at the same time. This is a very personal thing. So I just wanted to touch upon this. And there is another concept that we define called human bond communication, you know. When we communicate with humans one-on-one, uh, uh, -on -one, we communicate with the speech, or we send pictures, or we send uh, videos. That's how we communicate, right? Uh, or uh, we communicate through WhatsApp, or through Facebook, or whatever social uh, media we may have. So we uh, wrote a book back in uh, uh, 2017 on human bond communication. And uh, this was the first book we wrote. Uh, which is called on human bond communication, where we said, how about, uh, uh, how about uh, taking advantage of the three other uh, senses that we are not communicating from our devices? And those three things are smell, uh, taste, and a touch. Of course, we are able to use touch, but the only thing it, the touch does right now is you you just activate an application. That's all you do, as in UI. You touch it, something will happen. Or you touch your finger, move from one place to another uh, place. Through this capacitive thing, you just move uh, things around, right? But touch has many different dimensions. Touch means that a surface could become wa warm, it could become cold, it could become rough, it could become smooth, uh, it could become sticky. You know, all these are dimensions of touch that we have not exploited. And that's where the material technology comes into play. So when we talk about touch, it can have play a big role in gaming industry, for instance. You know, the gaming people, they're very much interested if you are playing a game, have a joystick or some kind of a mouse or whatever. If, you, if your handle becomes hot, if it becomes cold, if it becomes uh, rough or smooth, and it communicates different things, then uh, it gives you another kind of exhilarating experience in that game. Similarly, if I give you an example about a smell, if you are doing a race car in a game, and if your tire is rubbing uh, on, a, on a racing uh, track, and if, it, if you can create the smell right there, you'll get a different kind of experience. And if that experience goes to the other party, you get more immersive experience. So these are some of the newer kind of experiences these applications will be able to develop usually utilizing 5G or 6G technologies if we can, if we can uh, somehow electronically uh, determine, have sense. If we can sense what the smell is, what the taste is, how hot or cold it places and communicate it to the other place and, and display it. It's not easy thing to do. So this is a book we read, uh, we wrote, and it has many different um, uh, aspects. We go into a lot of detail about the technologies. Okay, I won't go into this, except to say that there are five human senses that we all know. Oral meaning is speech or sound that we all are familiar with. Optical is visual. So opti speech and visual, they are waves, electronic waves, right? How do I see something? It's a uh, optical waves that my eye is watching, is looking at, you know, different colors. This is, uh, this is optical wave. Speech is nothing but, uh, this is also waves, uh, sound waves. So this is based on waves. But if we look at tactile touch, smell and taste, they are mostly chemical reactions. If we think for a moment, how do I smell? How do I feel a smell? Very simply, I've got sensors in my nose, or each one of we have sensors. 
some kind of tissues. And if I smell something, uh, like uh, <coughs> if, you, uh, if you smell a bread, or if you smell papaya, or a different kind of food, or hamburger, you feel it, you can differentiate it, and though it creates some kind of electronic signal, and that it's not that that chemical thing goes in the brain, is the electrical signal goes in the brain, and it energizes certain parts of our brain, and we feel whether it is a hamburger or a bread or a papaya or a mango or whatever it is. So this is called how do we smell? And the same thing is with taste. When we are eating food, we feel the same way also. So it has a huge application uh, in the future, and as I will talk about. So, the, so there have been a lot of developments in something called electronic nose. People have been trying to develop electronic nose so that uh, these kind of electronic nose and electronic taste it could be utilized in manufacturing, in industrial domain. Like there are some hazardous operations where humans cannot go. So right now, how do they examine if there is some chemical reaction going on, some plastic industry is going on, or something, some process is going on, they usually have cameras, their cameras are looking at it, or it, it is monitoring something, sound, but if they can have a probe that can smell or if it can taste what how th uh, reactions are changing, and it can communicate with some kind of a control center that it will know ahead of time if the, if the reactions have gone wrong. Something bad is going to come uh, uh, maybe three years from now, four years from, from uh, four months, uh, four hours from now, and corrective actions can be taken. So in manufacturing, uh, this electronic nose, electronic uh, taste, they have huge applications, not to talk about the consumer industry amongst humans. And these two things, these two type of sensing have huge applications in healthcare industry as well. Because with the smell, if you can smell the, uh, your sweat or uh, if, uh, if the sweat or certain uh, with the smart watch or certain uh, wearable device if you are wearing, if you can analyze the chemicals, you can determine what kind of disease you have or what uh, future diseases might uh, happen to you. So these, uh, these kind of sensing technologies, these sensors have huge applications in healthcare industry. And people have built some kind of prototypes already to determine uh, uh, whether you have cancer or whether you have diabetes, and people have done these kind of experiments with the animals also, uh, that uh, the dog is able to sniff if somebody is having diabetes and so on and so forth. Some of them, uh, you may have read about it. Okay? So this basically shows this picture that uh, if there is an object, and if you have different kind of sensors deployed here, uh, you can capture different kind of information through different kind of sensors, and uh, you digitize those, those kind of uh, taste, smell, touch, speech, uh, images, send it to the other end, and then you synthesize it, you recreate it. And if you can recreate it, uh, it will give you, you can recreate, uh, you can basically recreate the image and uh, the environment that uh, you're trying to communicate to the other end. That's the whole idea behind, behind it. Now just to, I'll ask a question. Uh, can you think about uh, these color printers? What does a color printer do? Color printer has got uh, three primary colors, right? Red, uh, green, and blue. With those three colors, you are able to create many different kind of colors, right? Imagine if I can capture some primary smells and primary taste, and we can create these small cartridges of these things, right? And if I can excite them in a different way, 
So they will create different kind of uh, smells, and if you combine them, they'll give you the expel of a hamburger or a bread or of a pineapple or whatever. So if you can determine these primary uh, senses of a smell, of, a, of a taste, then anything can be created like we are able to do it in the color printer. So these are called sachets. This is the basic idea. Okay, so but doing these chemical things is always difficult. You know why? Because to create uh, putting something in your nose, if you are dealing with the chemicals, you know how do I how do I uh, communicate the smell to some other end? I'll have to wear something, right? Some kind of sensor in my nose, and if I wear, this is going to be a chemical sensor. So there are health effects because you are going to be exposing your nose to some chemicals, so there is a health issues involved here. Same thing is with touch about your tongue. But in the industrial environment, this could certainly be done very easily. And creating this thing at the other end is not a problem because you are just uh, recreating the smell by combining uh, some of these things. I'm just trying to give you some idea about these things. So a day may come where I have a, just don't think that it's a blue sky thing. A day may come that you buy a small device and you buy these sachets, the small, small cartridges that you fit in in this device and this device communicates over a Bluetooth or over um, a USB uh, device, micro uh, USB to your computer or to your smartphone and it will sense the smell, and it will communicate with this thing, it will go to the other end, and the other end will send the digital information, it will create that smell, or it will create that test. You can have those small portable devices that could come one day. That day will come, it may take five years or 10 years, because this is what the innovators and the startup community does. That's what they are good at doing. And I'm telling you, if they do it, Amongst uh, billions of people around the world, some millions will buy it, especially the younger population, and this will be a business case for them. Okay, so I, so this is another representation of the same thing. I don't want to go into this. I want to skip this uh, in the interest of time. Uh, so basically, this shows you have uh, uh, video, audio, touch, uh, smell, uh, uh, a taste. They all can go into an, uh, they, they are all captured through a sensor. Uh, they are combined through a multiplexer. And they are communicated at the other end. And they are demultiplexed. And they are synthesizers. And these synthesizers will play them back, combine them together, so you get an exp immersive experience. So if you are studying here, if you want to tell your mom and dad and your friend, uh, the kind of food you are eating, they can perhaps smell how good the food is, or or wherever you may be. Okay. So this is the picture that I explained to you earlier, that there are huge application in human to human application, human to machine application, and machine to machine applications. If you can take advantage of three other human senses that we have not been able to take advantage of so far. Okay, so these are the new th things that are about to come. This goes into the protocols uh, about uh, how to implement it. Uh, it goes into you sense it, you digitize it, communicate it, decompress it, and uh, demultiplex it, uh, synthesizes and re recreate it. Okay? This is one example, an application that can communicate touch, taste, and smell. There is a a uh, nice uh, article that was uh, written back about uh, uh, about 10 years ago, actually, by a professor at, uh, at a university in London. And this guy has created uh, a big laboratory in Singapore now. He's in some other part of the world. Uh, and he, there is a prototype he developed about uh, how to uh, uh, communicate touch, uh, taste, and smell. You can read it. 
Can I send the slides uh, already to Marcos? Professor Marcos, you can get them from him. This goes about the protocol stack, you know, how could uh, this be done? You have an application, there are perception sensors, how do you per uh, uh, communicate at the other end, encrypt and security controls, uh, network layer protocols, it goes at the other end. You do analytics, decision making, you fuse this information and you present it to the application at the other end. This is basically trying to show that uh, uh, there is a, a good article written about in a mixed reality lab. This lady is trying to find out whether it is a, a red wine or a white uh, wine uh, and through this sensing technology. And uh, more interesting thing is about this that I was talking about is uh, uh, the researchers are trying to find out they're trying to do, what they're trying to do is for certain kind of uh, smells and taste, maybe about eight or 10 or 12, they're trying to find out if you, if you smell bread, if you have a hamburger, if you smell rose and so on and so forth. If you smell those things, what areas of your brain get excited, you know, through MRI, functional MRI. So they, they give subjects this smell, and they MRI, they say, what areas get excited. Uh, so once you know what areas get excited, then you can, through magnets, or through some other means, you can excite those parts of your brain and can give you the feeling of that smell or that taste. So this is the brain-computer interfaces playing a role. So this guy can tell that this is a red wine because, uh, because the, uh, it has been determined which areas uh, get excited with certain smells and certain tastes. So if you excite those areas, then you will feel the same way. This is the idea, basic idea about it. So this work is already going on in the, in the laboratory and is called uh, 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 brain activity decoding and then you communicate that to the other end and you can encode the same thing, you can write it back. So you can smell the same thing. I'll skip this. Uh, I don't have the time to go into this, uh, but basically this is uh, uh, telling you uh, the state of the sensing technology, how to sense touch, smell, taste, and or oral uh, you know, speech and uh, uh, optical, we already know these two. So what are some of the sensing technologies? How do you sense it? And how do you replicate it? How do you recreate it? These are some of the technologies. And what is the state of those technologies in the research lab? And there are some startups which are already actually selling products in the Japanese market. There are some companies in the Japanese market who are selling products to sense, smell, and uh, taste and recreated their products already there in the Japanese market. They are not big opportunities for them, but uh, there are uh, some limited number of products in the market. I won't go into the detail. So this is another product, uh, you know, you may have heard about uh, what happens during Christmas time, you know, Christmas time, the toy industry, they are always trying to create new uh, toys, you know, for uh, babies and children. And parents uh, go gaga, they will buy them this cabbage page, uh, patch doll and so on and so forth. So, you know, there is a, there are certain uh, application whereby a mom is hugging a doll and this dog, this doll has some sensors and uh, this uh, hugging uh, experience gets communicated to the child the child may be someplace away and she is wearing a different kind of uh, 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 clothing and she will get the feeling that uh, her mom is uh, hugging her uh, maybe 500 kilometers away or 5,000. And you will be surprised there will be products, uh, there will be market for these kind of products, especially during Christmas time because children would like to play with these things. So this one basically shows uh, uh, as I was talking to you about, 
how do you create a scent you know how to create a smell and this has got huge application in the uh, perfume industry and the marketing industry you know now the marketeers what they do they market certain products by sending you images by showing you powerpoint presentations but if they can communicate a smell with a product you are more likely to buy or not buy not likely to buy the product so smell has a big role to play in motivating people uh, consumers to buy certain products so marketing has a huge uh, potential application of the smell technology and uh, this is what i am trying to uh, show here touch communication is haptic communication so uh, some of the shoe uh, companies they have developed uh, very interesting uh, sensors in the shoe and uh, so uh, blind people uh, they can walk because that is now integrated with the gps and the way you are walking where you are going uh, the uh, the person who is walking rather than taking the stick this person will get haptic information whether the blind person is walking on the right uh, area or not how rough it is what kind of uh, obstacles are along the way so this haptic technology is playing uh, is likely to play a, uh, a role for blind and disabled people as well okay i'll skip some of these things so now you know i was talking about the wearables so wearables are playing a huge role uh, through the smart uh, your smartphone and i i won't go into the uh, detail of it except to say there are different kind of sensors this person is wearing uh, he has got a touch sensor uh, he has got a uh, Uh, video uh, smell touch audio all of these sensors they get communicated through a hub which is your uh, uh, 5g data connection it gets communicated and get recreated okay some of you may have heard about uh, some of these products i know smart glasses from google and some other companies they are trying to create even more functional and immersive uh, glasses smart watch uh, smart shirt smart uh, bracelet a uh, smart ring smart ring if you are wearing a ring uh, so if you if you push the ring a little bit and uh, it can uh, if can go to my uh, phone and the other party at the other end can feel if he or she is wearing a similar kind of ring he or she will feel the vibration or it will move also so smart ring a smart belt a smart pants smart socks smart shoes so things are becoming more and more smart because of some of these newer technologies so the world is not going to stop now but it's going to become more complicated strange and uh, uh, we'll have to decide what we want to do with the all, with all of this may not be may not be a very good uh, future uh, in the future but it's up to us how we um, take advantage of it this is something i wanted to show that uh, there are companies working on uh, mind reading helmets so uh, a helmet you wear uh, to be able to uh, brain computer interface so being able to read your mind and even able to communicate that into ai applications and be able to take decisions for you uh, it hasn't been successful but we cannot say that uh, this won't happen sometime or a long time in the future so there are there is work going on in mind reading helmets uh, so you wear the helmet and uh, it will capture the information about what's happening in your brain and this could have a huge application in the healthcare industry just to tell you healthcare industry can be can benefit a lot and help us uh, in a positive way okay i won't go into this thing one thing i want to uh, say that uh, we are all academic and researchers and people are talking about uh, giving you 1 millisecond latency uh, 0.1 millisecond latency in 6g and so on and so forth 
But we should never forget that there are some limits of physics. The limits of physics are that uh, speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, right? The electrical signal cannot go faster than this. This is a reality, right? So if you send something from here to Kuala Lumpur or Shanghai, uh, it's probably 20,000 kilometers away. It will take, uh, you can easily divide 20,000 divided by 300,000. It will tell you how many milliseconds or seconds it will take. So just to give you uh, very simply, 300 kilometers, to go to 300 kilometers, it will take about uh, 0.1 millisecond, easily. So there are some physical uh, limits uh, because of physics involved. So when we talk about edge computing, uh, mobile edge, that's where some of these new architectures play a big role. So you deliver the content from the edge of the network not something coming from across the world, from, uh, uh, from, from um, 180 degrees apart, because it will take forever. That's why people are very much interested into edge cloud, edge computing, so that uh, the content is stored as close as possible on the tower itself, on the, in your uh, radio access network, so it is delivered fast, and you catch the information there. So that's why new architectures in communication and computing systems, they are being uh, developed right now. And the same thing goes about uh, how many transistors you can have in devices because of the, uh, 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 the, uh, the size of the atom. So current transistors is scaled to 10 to 20 nanometer in precision. But if you go down to five to seven nanometer atomic level, there's some quantum effects start taking place. So transistors, your VLSI devices cannot uh, uh, be shrunk any even more. So because of some limitations of physics. So I'm sure there will be some other new kind of architectures that will drive this electronics industry and the VLSI industry to provide you more and more storage and better, more and more computing power. So I just wanted to mention that not to forget about the limits of physics, as we as researchers keep on pushing the pushing the envelope. So I'll stop here. No need to go into research. Uh, let me see how I'm doing time-wise, because I do want to. Uh, okay, eight eleven. Okay. So maybe I'll take another half an hour. Okay. Yeah. So. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, the main idea uh, for me to give here is that uh, the lots of, uh, you know, step back and keep an open mind and think about uh, what uh, we as entrepreneurs can do, where the startup opportunities are, where innovation can come, and how you, one could develop uh, new ideas to sell to the big uh, companies or the big ideas because that's what they are, uh, they would be more interested in when it comes to research. Uh, so I just want to spend some time about, about IEEE Future Networks Roadmap. Uh, so IEEE has got uh, something called uh, uh, Future Networks uh, uh, Technical Community, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it. And we have a working group here that is working on connecting the unconnected, connecting the three billion people around the world. So I'll touch upon that, because that is very relevant to now. Uh, what I was talking to you about, the future, the, the things about to come, uh, where the research is going on, from a research perspective. And that should give some ideas about good research topic to the academics to work on. Uh, that's what the whole idea was. Rather than keep on doing the same thing that uh, I worked on and many people have been working on in the past. So I will uh, introduce the IEEE Future Networks Technical Community. Uh, I already showed you this diagram about uh, uh, 6G. 6G is also called IMT 2030 uh, from I by ITU, which is International Telecommunication Union, has given a name IMT 2030. And 5G used to be called IMT 2020, that's the name given to the standard. 
I won't spend the time. So the, the way the IEEE, because uh, most of us are who are here, they are IEEE members or Comsoc members. So just to step back and think how IEEE is organized. It's important to uh, know the forest before we get into the trees. So there are lots and lots of uh, um, IEEE members, about half a million IEEE members around the world. There is a board of directors, there is executive director, and there is a staff. There is a technical activities uh, board, publications activities, standards activities, members and geographical activities, educational activities. And technical activities, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it has got many um, societies around the world, organizes about 1,300 plus uh, conferences annually around the world. Publication has got 30 plus percent of the world's uh, electron, electro-technical uh, publications that come out of IEEE. Standards has developed uh, uh, over 1,300 active standards, 600 projects are ongoing. Members, there are about 420,000 members in 190 countries. And there are 600, uh, over 600 educational courses in the IEEE learning. Uh, so this is how they are, they are organized, they are, uh, they are structured. And the, we have within IEEE, we have something called IEEE Future Networks Technical Community. And this, uh, the, uh, the foundation or the beginning of this is called IEEE. Uh, it, this was founded uh, back in 2017. It was called IEEE 5G initiative. IEEE wanted to get into 5G, but quickly it was uh, renamed as Future Network Initiative. And when it matured, it is now called Future Networks Technical Community. So the, some of the milestones are it was started in 2017. We had one first event in 2018 as a conference. Uh, 2019, we had the roadmap document Connecting the Unconnected Working Group was launched in 2021. Many other groups were la launched, and I would not go into that. So Future Network Technical Community is driven by uh, steering committee, which has got two subcommittees, seven committees, 15 technical working groups. There are about over 2,000 active volunteers around the world. Uh, these are the uh, current chairs of the Future Network communi uh, Community. And this community is sponsored by nine societies. The lead society is Comsoc. Because Comsoc contributes about, I don't exactly remember, but probably about 30% of the budget of FNTC. FNTC comes from Comsoc. The rest of the budget comes from the other eight societies. So it produces a lot of content. Uh, so it has webinars, newsletters, podcasts. We have three major events. Uh, there is a Future Networks World Forum Conference that is organized. Uh, the next one is happening in Dubai in October. We have Connecting the Unconnected Summit and Global Competition around the world. The fourth one is happening this year, and I'll talk about that. And then we have First Responders and Tactical Networks uh, works, uh, Conference. And then we have e-learning, distinguished lectures, and so on and so forth. OK, so this is the structure of the Future Networks Technical Community. I won't go into uh, much detail, except that within this uh, Future Networks Technical Community, we have got INGR, which is uh, uh, International Network uh, uh, Generation Roadmap Working Group. It creates a roadmap of 6G and all the other technologies. It, it just creates a strategy document or a roadmap document. And it has got 15 working groups. And I will uh, briefly mention uh, what they are. I'll skip this. I'll not spend the time. Uh, so the name of INGR is International Networks Generations Roadmap is one of the committees within FNTC where all the technical work gets done in 14 uh, technical working groups. And uh, this, uh, this is generation, and they, these are the 
volunteers around the world who are contributing to the development of the roadmap of uh, FNTC. Okay, I won't go into this, except to say that uh, it has got uh, 14 working groups. There is a satellite working group, there is a deployment working group, connecting the unconnected working group, edge automation platform, so edge, uh, where the edge computing things get uh, covered, massive MIMO system optimization, there is a, you have a system lab, uh, laboratory here, system de department here may be interested, optics working group, millimeter wave, Standardization building blocks, test bed working group, energy efficiency, security, the secu very active security working group, application services working group, AI and machine learning. And these are divided into four categories, user access, satellite is access, uh, network components and performance category, systems and standards category, services and enablers, and we have we have, we have uh, published a number of chapters or white papers from each one of these working groups. We have published uh, three, about, uh, three editions already, and you can download them free of cost if you go to the website, and uh, you can just uh, uh, Google it, uh, IEEE Future Network uh, Technical uh, Community, uh, INGR and uh, you can go to the link, you can download it, uh, any of these uh, white papers. There are lots of very interesting um, research topics, what the state of the art is, and anybody can start contributing and become a volunteer. It's not uh, only me or some very select number of people, any one of you can become the contributor by writing to the committee, uh, the working group chairs, and become a contributor and ask questions and start attending the meetings. These are the various working groups. Uh, who are the chairs of the working group? Uh, these are the email contacts to participate. And uh, for instance, for the uh, uh, <coughs> connecting the unconnected, uh, I'm the working group co-chair with the Ashutosh Datta. Uh, so connecting the unconnected working group is something that I lead. So let me uh, spend about 10 or 15 minutes about connecting the unconnected working group, which uh, I'm sure impacts uh, Guatemala, Latin America, because I'm sure in rural areas, a lot of the people are not connected through broadband. It's a challenge. Uh, okay. So I'm the co-chair along with Ashur Datta. And Ashur Datta, he's also the co-founder of uh, the FNTC, uh, which was founded in 2017. So there are two working groups that are very relevant to connecting the unconnected working group. One of them is connecting the unconnected working group. Uh, the other one is the satellite working group. Because we are very much interested in satellite because with satellite you can reach remote areas because it's very expensive to lay fibers or to utilize a microwave or to, or to get the mobile companies or the network providers to provide connectivity to rural areas because they don't see the revenue opportunity there. So they basically are not keen to provide broadband connectivity to rural areas because there are not many customers or they don't have the ability to pay for it. So big players are not interested in connecting rural areas, but satellite has that capability. That's why we are interested in satellite working group. So uh, there are three main reasons why we have connecting the unconnected working group. First of all, that uh, connect, we want to tell the governments around the world that, and the ITU and at sea that connecting the unconnected should be at the top of their list to bring all these people in the, uh, in the electronic transaction world, to bring them in the e-world, digital world so that they can sell their products, uh, they can take advantage of the enormous knowledge that is available on the web and so on and so forth. So that's why, you know, if the rural people can come on the internet, they, they are empowered, you know. Uh, women get empowered, uh, agriculture gets improved, and it has a huge impact uh, on 
the national GDP. That's one role. The other role is develop and fine tune the standards. Technology is not the challenge to connect the unconnected people, is the affordability. And giving the right kind of applications and right kind of content that they are interested in. The rural people are interested in increasing their income. And they are also interested in getting good education. They are interested in good health care. They are interested in safety and security. They are not interested in uh, uh, social networking. They are not that much interested in what's happening uh, about the presidential election in the US or uh, what is happening in the Ukraine war. The rural people mostly are very much interested in, in increasing their income. That's their main goal. So we have to be able to provide the right kind of applications and right kind of application uh, content so that they will sign up for broadband and they'll, they will pay for it. Otherwise, they will not pay because it's too expensive. When compared to uh, feeding their family, the percentage of uh, money they'll have to spend on the broadband is too much for them to afford unless it is able to bring revenue or income to them. That's so that is the main challenge. So scope of the CTU working group is to articulate the necessity along with the use cases to connect the unconnected people in the rural areas. I'll skip. So why should digital divide really means? I know somebody today, I met Karen this morning. She said she's very much interested in social causes, into sustainability, into uh, working for NGOs and you know, social things. So why, why, why should digital divide really mean uh, that the digital divide threatens our society? If there are more and more people who are poor and uneducated, there will be more crime. Uh, even if we become rich, uh, I don't think we'll be living in a very safe environment and a very happy environment. So we need to worry about people who are being left behind. So because about 3 billion people around the world are still unconnected or underconnected. Unconnected meaning they can they only talk, they don't have the data. Or if they, they are connected over 2G or maybe 3G, which is not adequate for internet. And I'll show you some real numbers. So there is a huge cost to our society around the world. They don't have sufficient digital skills. They do not know how to use information because they are not digitally competent. And that is hampering innovation because all these people in rural areas, they are not able to innovate. I'll give you one very good example, uh, a very interesting example. How poor people and people who, who know very simple things can innovate. You know, many, many years ago, there was, there was a company in Japan, and they were, they were making soap, right? And there was an automated uh, factory, and uh, they were making all these bars, and there was a machine that was wrapping uh, these soaps. But they were finding that there are certain soaps where they were not getting wrapped, or some other things that were going out where there was no soap inside, it was empty wrap. That is how products were going sometimes. This is what happened in Japan. I don't remember when it happened, but many, many years ago. So what they did, because they are very technology oriented, they bought, they bought a lot of technology from US. From GE, they bought X-ray machine. They bought this machine, that machine that will take the X-ray and you reject uh, uh, the things that are coming out of the uh, fa fa assembly line, uh, the unwrapped uh, soap, it will sort it out. They invested heavily in the assembly line. You know, there was another company in India. Many years ago, they were building soap, and they had the same problem. You know, what, what a simple guy said, you know, we don't want to deploy all this technology. He said, well, let me just buy a a ten dollar fan, electrically driven fan, you know fan, right? Electrical fan that blows air, and he just put the fan in the assembly line, connected it, and whenever there was an empty paper, it will just blow the paper away. 
So it was just removing the paper that way. So there was a $10 solution working to millions of dollars solution. So sometimes very simple solution can be equally effective than thinking technically always. So technology is not always a, a good solution, you know. Some very simple people with a very simple mind can come up with very, with very innovative solutions because that's how they think, you know, because they are trying to find solutions with what they have. But technical people are always thinking about how can I use uh, machine learning, how can I do data processing, how can I do machine. Some, this is not, sometimes it's not cost effective. That's a very good example I wanted to give to you. And the United Nations has said that internet had the ability to dismantle the divide, but internet has failed uh, miserably. And the divide is getting bigger every time we go to 3G, to 4G, to 5G, and now to 6G, because the smartphones are much more expensive, the service is more expensive, so people can't afford it, and, they are, and it becomes very complicated to use also. The comp digital complexity increases also, because a lot of the people here cannot, they are not digitally competent, they don't know about uh, computer science, they can only speak, or they cannot read or write in certain parts of the world, so they cannot read, you know, the web, the content. So they, they can only speak, or they, if the application can uh, speak back to them, and they can respond to back in a speech, then maybe that application will be useful, and the same thing goes with images and video as well. So this is what the United Nations said. This is the real figures uh, back in 2020. And in certain regions of the world, in Middle East, in, uh, in 2020, there were about, uh, in, in, there were about uh, 50 percent of the people in 2020, they were using a 2G. In 2013, they were using 70 percent of the population was still connected over 2G. If you look at uh, Latin America, in 2013, there are about over 60, 62 per percent of the people, they were using 2G. Now that number has come down to about uh, maybe 25 percent. They're still using 2G technology. This is a reality uh, around us. Same thing goes with the Northern America, Africa, the situation is even worse. So all of these people, they're still using 2G. And maybe these, this is uh, uh, the, the, the percentage of people who are using 2G is going down, but it's going slowly, and the, all these people are being left behind. So that's why IEEE is very much interested in bringing focus to connecting the unconnected, uh, uh, encourage more research, uh, bring more visibility, and maybe for that reason we have been able to drive the vision of 6G and HC to have connecting the unconnected and sustainability as one of the arc uh, visions of the 6G, in 6G standards, which was not there up until 5G. Uh, some of you may have heard about the uh, 17 uh, sustainability development goals of uh, uh, United Nations, that by 2030 the goal is there will be no private, uh, poverty, no hunger, good health, good quality, good gender equality, peace and justice, life on uh, land and so on and so forth. But all of these things are possible only through digital internet, internet connectivity because because uh, providing connectivity is cheaper than building hospitals, building roads, building schools. That is much more expensive. Building physical infrastructure is much more expensive than providing digital connectivity and empowering people to take advantage of whatever is already available. So that is the uh, advantage of providing connectivity. I won't uh, go into this. And why people are not connected, 3 billion people? Because they don't see the value of uh, broadband, uh, of uh, digital health, education, entrepreneurship that we are not able to provide. They don't have the technology and capacity to absorb digital technology. Many of these people in living remote and rural areas, they don't know how to take advantage of the technology that is available to them. Like uh, 
uh, internet banking, mobile banking, uh, mobile payment, uh, checking their accounts. You know, they are not capable of it or they are very prone to uh, being defrauded as well uh, because they are very innocent people as well who live in rural areas. And then there are affordability reasons which basically means we need to come up with very good business and economic models to serve our rural period, rural uh, community. This is United Nations had uh, created a high level panel on digital cooperation with some very, very famous uh, people. Uh, Melinda Gates from Bill Gates, uh, Windsurf who is the inventor of uh, internet and from around the world. From everywhere, uh, from many parts of the world including Latin America, Africa, Asia and so on. Okay, I won't go into the detail here. So basically this picture shows that 5G had three main goals, enhance mobile broadband, massive machine type communication, and provide ultra reliable and low latency communication for uh, self-driving cars. So these were the three main use cases, but they never had connecting the, connecting all as one of the goals. That's why 5G was never developed for that reason. But we are changing that with 6G. So people are talking, what is the killer app for 6G? People are saying some of the killer app are sustainability, connecting the unconnected people because people don't know what 6G is going to be used for because 5G can do a lot of things already. And we want to have ultra long battery life. Uh, how can we charge it through ambient uh, light around us? Uh, how can 6G work indoor and outdoor? Uh, seamless connectivity between uh, Wi-Fi and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and cellular technology. So this basically shows uh, 2G was called GSM, UM 3G was called UMTS, 4G was LTE, 5G was IMT 2000, 6G is IMT. Uh, th uh, 2030 and so on and so forth. I won't go into this. Okay, I won't go into that. And then, uh, very interesting part is, uh, there is, uh, some of the challenges are that rural areas, they are very sparse and clustered communities. Uh, very few people living, so there is not incentive to build a network there. And then one other interesting part is that there, there are political reasons too. In many parts of the world, the governments don't want the rural people to become very smart. They don't want to get access to internet. If they become uh, empowered, then uh, some of these governments can be overthrown, you know, because they are ruled by uh, dictators, they are ruled by uh, highly corrupt. So if people become very knowledgeable in rural areas, which are really vote banks, they are the ones who vote north in the urban areas, you know, like over here, maybe three, four, five million people live in the city, but vast majority live in remote and rural areas who are easily managed and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, they, they, they are given the wrong information. And if they get empowered, they know what their reality is, then they can get overthrown. So governments are also not very much interested in giving uh, internet connectivity and in empowering them because they want to stay in power. Unfortunate, but this is true. And in uh, rural villages, there are village heads. Uh, there is a head of a village. If the, if so village head gets paid by the government because he's part of some system. And uh, so this village head will lose the power. So this is in many parts of the world, in Africa, Latin America, India, everywhere. So the village power, the village head delivers the votes to people who are in power uh, up in the capital and the state capitals. So they want to retain power, so they are not very much interested that uh, the population gets the, they get bypassed and they get empowered. So there is this political angle to this. But it's only simply a matter of time when this will uh, not be an issue. I won't go into this thing uh, in the detail.
detail. Uh, okay, I'll skip some of these things. And then uh, something else I was talking about, the content. You know, you can provide connectivity to rural areas, but if there is not good knowledge, content that is available for them, it is connectivity doesn't do them any good. Which basically means at the national level, there has to be good national knowledge portals, which basically means a repository of data for selected verticals. Uh, so for healthcare, there should be good content that is available to people, uh, good education, you know, with that what I mean, if, if uh, somebody is in uh, for the seventh grade or eighth grade or ninth grade, all the textbooks, they should be digitized and they should be made available online to the schools and it should be possible to provide the best teacher available from any part of the country to the village areas, to the rural areas. So if there is a very good teach, physics teacher in uh, Guatemala City, he or, should, he or she should be able to teach to a remote area through broadband connectivity. Because you may open schools in a remote area, in a village, but if there are no good teachers available, it doesn't do them any good. So you need to have uh, these good teachers available uh, remotely who would uh, give good education. And content being available, so if the teacher is not available, people can go and read by themselves. Uh, how to, if they don't understand certain concepts. So there is a lot of opportunities in the education sector uh, for education, for digital education. I would not go into this. Then I was talking about uh, new business models for the rural community. So there is something called a micro operator uh, ecosystem. The big operators like Claro, Mobile, and so on and so forth, they're not interested in co connecting a rural population, except maybe for wireless, uh, for, uh, for talking. Or if you go along the highways, you'll find along the highways, maybe five or 10 kilometers uh, on both sides, there is coverage. But if you go deeper, there is no coverage, you know. Or there's no data, you know. You'll probably get 4G or 3G along the highway, but uh, if you go beyond, you'll probably uh, have uh, 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 very poor data connectivity. But uh, what I'm saying here is that there has to be uh, promotion so that uh, there will be a rural operator in the village of about maybe 500 people. Some local entrepreneur will build the infrastructure will because he or she knows the people and he will share in the revenue. He will build the infrastructure May, uh, provide the connectivity through the uh, to the big operator through the government uh, fiber optical network or whatever he'll get the revenue and share it with the backbone operator so we need new kind of uh, operator ecosystem which is a micro operator who will work with a large operator or with the government uh, to provide connectivity okay so uh, uh, we have two main two big activities that we have going on in IEEE FNTC, Future Network Technical Community, mm -hmm. driven by the Connecting the Unconnected Working Group. So we have got, uh, one of them is called Connecting the Unconnected Challenge, Global Challenge, where we give out money. Maximum award is uh, $10,000. And we are running, running the fourth time this year. Uh, two of them were virtual, third one was in person in Kuala Lumpur with, uh, with Groupcom. So this is an annual competition that revolves early stage achievements in connectivity. It's global, open to all. Uh, there are two tracks. There is a proof of concept uh, track and there is a concept only. Concept only meaning you can submit your proposal only if it is just an idea. You don't need to have something working in the laboratory or working in the field. If you have a great idea, uh, technical idea, or how can you take advantage of community, or if you have a good business model, you can also submit an idea and uh, be a winner uh, and be awarded by IEEE. And in each one of those uh, two tracks, proof of concept and concept only, we have three 
सब कैटेगरीज टेक्निकल एप्लीकेशन बिजनेस मॉडल्स एंड कम्युनिटी इनेबलमेंट ओके सो देर आर टू ट्रैक्स प्रूफ ऑफ कॉन्सेप्ट एंड कॉन्सेप्ट ऑनली इज जस्ट आइडिया ऑनली प्रूफ ऑफ कॉन्सेप्ट यू शुड हैव सम लेबोरेटरी डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन सम प्रोटोटाइप or some something you are showing and then there are top prize is the best overall proposal uh, there is a best overall proposal and concept only uh, uh, track and there are category prizes technical business model community so we have total about 14 prizes that we gave out maximum amount is uh, $10000 so uh, so we focus on early stage projects and and ideas um and we want to promote uh, this global thing you know uh, provide ipl to provide support so that um, there is a local uh, motivation to create a solution and deployment deploy it uh, locally for connecting the unconnected uh, people so in 2021 which was the first year of the competition we have 257 submissions from 69 countries many of them from latin america also there were 11 awardees and there were one honorable mention that 12 awards were given we had given out 60000 prize pool and they were they were invited to give presentation at the ipcc ctu connecting the unconnected summit that we also organize one day summit uh, somewhere in the world and 2026 we have 226 submissions from 43 countries we gave out 13 awards and three honorable mentions with 60000 67000 prize pool and this prize money comes from many different companies it could be vmware facebook uh, google uh, microsoft they all put the money to to the pool that we give out and some of it comes from ipcc also in 2023 last year we had close to 300 submission from 43 countries uh, 247 uh, submissions were reviewed by 41 members of the selection committee uh, we had uh, 14 technical prize winners there were 100 there was 133000 in prize pool and there are some companies we say well we want to have our own prize so like canada vmware in canada they said we have we want to have prize only for um, proposal that come out of canada uh, only for canadians so we gave prize uh, so they gave a huge uh, bunch of money to itripadi so we selected a winner just from proposals that came from canada for uh, for canada so that thing also happened uh okay this shows i have in 2023 there were 26 proposals from companies or commercial entities 32% proposals were non profit organizations 12% came from students uh, academics and professors they submitted 17% individuals submitted 9% others 4% so the out of uh, uh, total uh, 169 were proof of concept proposals we had some prototype something to show and concept only proposal ideas con- proposals were only 127 just to give you an idea about the type of proposals we received uh, okay i won't go into this detail uh, the country of submissions in 2023 versus 2022 2023 we got most of the proposals came from nigeria uh, they were uh, tw- uh, so uh, 2023 nigeria number 1 usa number 2 kenya 28 uganda 21 south africa 20 india 17 canada 15 tanzania 14 malaysia 11 9 so there were many countries represented that what it is showing and then we also have a conference that uh, that fntc organizes every year every year that is called a future networks world forum uh, the third edition of this is going to be organized in dubai from 15th to 17th of october 2024 and connecting the unconnected summit 
and uh, awards will be given out uh, just before uh, this conference, uh, which is, will be 14th of 14th of October. On 14th of October, the CTU summit will be held, where the awards will be given out. So these two events will be co-located. All right, you can go to the uh, website. Uh, you can just Google IEEE Future Networks World Forum, or you can Google uh, IEEE CTU Global Challenge, and you can go to the web pages of these uh, uh, these places. Um, so this is the the. the this is a connecting the unconnected web page. Unfortunately, the deadline is over. Uh, it was 5th of June, 2024. And uh, uh, the summit is to be held on 14th of October. But uh, if you are interested, you can certainly uh, come and submit uh, for the next year for this uh, competition. And we don't only give the award. There is a, a mentorship committee. Uh, the, the goal of mentorship committee is they are winning a proposal. They are mentored by IEEE volunteers to help them to develop their proposal into a commercial product, how to uh, roll it out, uh, try to connect them into uh, a company, connect them with the companies and uh, investment uh, 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 investors as well who would fund their ideas. So, so it's just not that we give the award out and it's done, but there's a mentorship committee which will help them to take their idea forward, deploy it, commercialize it, and connect them with, some, with the investment community. So we, we just continue the engagement uh, uh, moving forward. Okay. So with that, uh, this is the last uh, slide. You can join IEEE Future Networks by bit.ly. Forget about it. You can just Google it. IEEE Future Network Technical Committee, FNTC. You'll come to a website of IEEE, and there's a lot of information available. With that, I'll stop here. OK. I could go on and on, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think that kind of information is um, already available. Uh, the, uh, the past winners. Uh, their projects are available already on the connecting the unconnected uh, web page or if you go to the the third edition of the connecting connecting the unconnected uh, white paper uh, there is a chapter in the end this section which lists all the winners also so or you write to me i'll provide you the list of all the winners uh, so it's, it's equally available. But don't be restricted by what you read, because you may have a better idea. So we don't want to uh, bias uh, the thinking into submitting something that is a look alike, you know. Or you may want to think something totally different. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you want to contribute, uh, you can, uh, I will invite you or anybody here to join the Connecting the Unconnected Working Group and help us uh, 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 revise uh, the current version of the white paper to the next version. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, just one question. Sure. <laughs> uh, do, do you have any knowledge in Norway or Finland that uh, do you have any 6G island deployments already done there? No, nobody. Oh. Yeah, 6G is still at a very early stage. People are still thinking about uh, what should it be. Uh, and people are just talking in very general terms. But uh, I, uh, HC, 3GPP, is already in the process of developing some standards work. But the funny thing is that uh, 5G is already evolving to 5G plus, 5G plus plus, 5G Express, and uh, 5G release 18, release 19, 20, 21. So these releases, uh, who knows, they will end up becoming one of the six, uh, deliverables of 6G, who knows. But it's, uh, no, there are no deployments. Yeah. Yeah. So 6G. 
it's not about the technology, you know, like the Christian, you're working on edge computing and all that. So the big challenge always is about the backhaul. You can provide the coverage uh, very easily in a rural area. You can have some Wi-Fi hotspots uh, that could be at some people's homes and uh, connect them. But how do you connect with the bigger city, you know, with a broadband point of presence? This backhaul is a big problem. So there is a lot of interest in um, uh, storing content as uh, close as possible to the village. So maybe there should be a, a village server, a server that is in the village itself. It's like edge computing. So all the most uh, relevant information, the useful information that people are interested in, it should be cached in the village server so it is delivered directly. Especially if it is video. Because a video kills the performance. Because if everybody is watching movie, or video streaming in the rural area, then nobody will get good service. So anything that is video related and is useful, that should be locally stored. And whatever is non-video, it should be delivered. It should be possible to get it from the source or wherever the big point of presence is. So, so we need new kind of architectures for this. And the local server in the village, it should be updated, maybe in the middle of the night, between 12 midnight to 4 a.m. You just update it with the new content. Or maybe some vehicle goes around once a day and it uploads that with the content that really people need. Agricultural information, uh, edu uh, educational information, safety, security, uh, banking, you know, all those things. So, so that is where the challenge is, you know. How do you provide right type of content which is affordable, cheap? Because, you know, in certain parts of the world, if you go to Malawi and uh, uh, Ethiopia and all those places, their mobile bill or data bill will be, um, I don't know, they're spending maybe 40, 50 percent of their income on food and 20, 30 percent on education. And if they are to spend 30 percent on broadband, they can't afford it. That's the big problem. But I, I agree that in 6G, for connecting the unconnected, they need to bring down the cost. Cost of the operation, you know, to bring it affordable. That's where the problem is, not the not the uh, not the technology yeah, yeah. and then regulations the government also need to make these regulations uh, simpler and uh, requirements should be uh, loose because you have a lot of requirements in urban areas about interference and all that uh, but in rural area they can give a free license free bandwidth uh, longer range for uh, more power. So they, sh they need to have two types of regulations, one for rural area, one for urban area. But then have also safeguards so that the big operator will not exploit the rural uh, community because they can get it, get there for free. You know, you have to have that uh, safeguards also. So, so we, requ we require uh, some kind of uh, rethinking about regulations for rural areas and for urban areas. I think the most advanced advances in smell, uh, electronic nose. Electronic nose is being developed by many uh, professionals and researchers for the healthcare industry and also for industrial applications. Uh, that is easier done. Uh, taste doesn't have much application right now, so that is moving slowly. And as far as uh, touch is concerned, that needs a lot of advancement in material technologies. So for example, if I have a, a, a display, some material, and if I energize it, uh, how can I energize it locally so it will become hot, it will become cold, it will become... 
rough, it will become smooth. So that, that depends a lot on material technology. But there things are moving. It's not there that they are standstill. So smell is number one, they, which they call electronic nose. Then uh, obviously uh, taste. And the third one is uh, your touch in that way. And uh, there's a lot of interest of the gaming industry. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dixit, for your very nice presentations. And also, it's, uh, está abierto este concurso de Future Networks and Connected Networks para el próximo año. Eh, definitivamente a través de IEEE, ya sea con, con, los que, con, con la parte de IEEE Guatemala, pues podemos ver eh, de apoyarlos y, y ustedes puedan participar de esto a nivel global. Si se dan cuenta, casi que solo países de África son los que están metiendo esto, yo creo que nosotros podemos meter algo para el próximo año. ¿verdad? Entonces, y de nuevo, muchas gracias y un gran aplauso ahí para el doctor. De...